Hi everybody, namaste, and welcome to another episode of Uladu Narpadu. I'm laughing because <laughs> I never know when I sit down to do these what I'm going to say. <laughs> and sometimes, especially right in the beginning, I'll make some really funny mistake <laughs> and have to do it over again. This time it didn't happen, <laughs> but I was ready to, to laugh if it did. Anyway, uh, before we get to the verse today, I want to thank Bhuvana, one of our viewers, a regular viewer, <laughs> who referred me to the Sri Ramanopadesh Shinun Malai, a book by Sadhu Om. And this book is wonderful because it has the original text and word by word translations of uh, the original work. So I'm very pleased to get it because it has much richer and deeper translations that bring out the natural ambiguity of the Tamil language. Uh, Tamil is similar to Sanskrit in that there are more than one way to interpret almost everything, <laughs> almost every sentence. So that makes it wonderful and deep. Uh, because all the layers of meaning are relevant and in a work like this, true. So thank you very much, Bhuvna. Uh, I'll be using the translation sourced from this book from now on. Of course, I do edit them a little bit to make them uh, into better English, but uh, I'm drawing on their depth and richness for the talks. Anyway, so today's verse. If oneself is a form composed of flesh, the world and God will also be forms. If oneself is not a form, who can see their forms and how? Can that which is seen be otherwise than the seer? Self the real eye is limitless, the eye which is devoid of the limitation of name and form. And we've talked about this many times, not only in this series, but in previous series like the Nibbana series and the uh, Golden Flower series, how name and form makes the world that we see. Not only the names and forms that we ascribe to the world, but especially the one that we give to ourselves. Now, to clarify this, the Buddha's teaching of Paticca Samuppada is very useful. Paticca Samuppada says, in the beginning, there is ignorance. Well, the step before that is <laughs> that we are all the self, always. Uh, we are nothing but the self. We are nothing but Brahman, always, forever, <laughs> unconditionally. Yet, out of ignorance, and what is ignorance? Is ac ignorance is actually three things. Ignorance in itself means that we don't know or don't foresee the consequences of our actions. We do something because it, it seems to be a good idea, but we don't really understand the implications and how it will affect us in the future. Not only ignorance, but also desire. We want something. We want something, so overlooking the possible consequences, we go ahead and do it anyway. Uh, then afterwards, of course, we suffer. And one more thing, delusion. Delusion means seeing something as something else, not understanding what it really is. The rope and the snake, for example. Uh, so these three things are at the root of all our problems, ignorance, desire, and delusion. And they, they all support each other. The Buddha uses a very good example of bundles of straw. You see here in India, especially, when they 
harvest the straw from the fields. Then they'll make bundles huh? and they'll stand those bundles against each other up off the ground to keep them dry. So if you have three bundles of straw leaning against each other like this and you pull one of them out, well, the other two will fall down too. And it's the same way with ignorance, desire, and delusion. As soon as you get rid of one of them, the other two collapse automatically. But we're looking at it now from the top down. Huh? So from the top, where we are one with the self, because self is only one. It has no divisions, no boundaries, huh? internal or external. No limitations either. But then, because of ignorance, huh? because of desire, because of delusion, then we fabricate name and form. In other words, nothing actually has a name. And there really is no form in the self. Self is formless. Because form depends on divisions, on boundaries. Huh? This is, this is me, and this is not me. So, based on this idea of divisions and boundaries between one thing and another, we create forms, and then we give them names. So, name and form go together to make mind. And mind, of course, is the basis of ego. And then consciousness. So as he says in the verse here, if we think of ourselves as a form composed of flesh, well, then the world and God that we see are going to be like that too. And indeed, we see how people make God in their own image. Huh? They project. They imagine a form of God that really is just like them. So, <laughs> but we need God to explain away how we got ourselves in this position, in this condition where we're suffering. Huh? Because after all, if we take responsibility for it, <laughs> that means that we could get out of it. But no, no, the ego wants to blame somebody else. Huh? I didn't do it. It was God. <laughs> so we imagine a whole, a whole landscape, huh? of forms and names with God and the world, with boundaries and divisions and differences. And this becomes our world. Why? Because of those three, ignorance, desire, and delusion. So now what do we do? Well, first of all, we have to attack this problem at the root. If we try to cut the branches and leaves it will only make it worse. This is why when people ask questions like, how do I uh, stop my bad karma? Bhagwan, Ramana, would answer, you can't, or it's not worth the effort. Because everything you do to try to adjust your karma is simply going to create additional karma in the future. See, that question is asked out of ignorance. It's like, oh, I'm having a run of bad luck. What can I do to have good luck instead? Uh, so the problem is if you do anything at all, take any action whatsoever, that becomes a cause of further karma, further rebirths and so on. So you can't attack it from that angle. You have to go to the root of the problem and the root of the problem is ignorance not knowing or having forgotten that one is actually Brahman, that one is actually pure awareness, not even consciousness, because awareness has no object. It simply is what it is. That's why we say I, I, not even I am, because am implies that. If you have a subject and a predicate, then it implies there must be an object too. So to get around this ontological difficulty, 
We have to use knowledge. That's why this path is called jnana. Jnana means knowledge, not just book knowledge, not just knowledge of words and concepts, but experiential knowledge. So by experience, everyone can understand that I am I. Huh? I am. I'm aware of my existence. Now, if I am aware of my existence, that means I am not simply a lump of flesh. I'm something more than that. And I'm not a mind either. Because a mind cannot be aware. It's simply a computer. It's just mechanical, like the body. The body has no awareness in and of itself. But we come into the body, or we associate ourselves, or identify ourselves with the body. And because of that, the body seems to be alive. It seems to have awareness and identity and so many things. But these are all illusions, or actually delusions, of seeing one thing as another. Seeing the rope as a snake. Really, we are only Brahman. We are only a pure awareness. But then we see ourselves as being so many things, a mind, a body, desires, possessions, relationships, on and on and on it goes. And these are all basically imaginary. Uh, name and form, dreams. Uh, so because of these dreams, we are captivated and we, we think these things are real. But even if you accept only that you are a body, huh? a bag of meat and bones, consider this. Everything we see, everything we hear, everything we experience through our senses, and the mind is also a sense, huh? has to go through our nervous system. It has to go through the ganglia of the nerves and then into the brain where it gets processed in various ways so that we don't get overwhelmed. The amount of data coming in through the senses is enormous. If we had to process each and every bit of it, parse through it all on our own, it would be overwhelming, it would be too much. Just vision. I, I calculated one time that just the input from one eye uh, is something like 10 megabits per second. Uh, or 10 megabytes, I think, 10 megabytes per second, or 10 mega, 100 megabits a second, approximately. So who can process all that information? It has to be abstracted. And this is another function of name and form. We identify something, say, oh, that's a camera. And now I don't have to deal with all of these details of the shape, the form, the controls, the thing. it's just a camera. Uh -huh. So, and then I deal with the thing as a token, a semantic, a tag, the name camera. So that makes things a lot easier to deal with. And we think in terms of these tags rather than in terms of the actual experience of the thing. Anyway, <laughs> it's all illusion. This all takes place within consciousness. After all, if we weren't conscious of these objects like cameras and so on. We couldn't do anything with them. So they all only exist in our consciousness. When we're asleep at night, the whole world goes away. And when we wake up in the morning, it all comes back. <laughs> so that's proof that it only exists in our consciousness. So the real self, the real I, only sees in terms of itself, pure awareness. That's why we say, I, I. I see only I. So that doesn't mean that we only see, for example, a vast light or something like that. I mean, yeah, there is that level. Huh? But we also see what other people call the world as only our own consciousness with some overlay of name and form. So it's not like the enlightened person or the self-realized person goes into a trance and is unaware of the world. I mean, yes, there is different forms of samadhi and stuff. Nirvikalpa samadhi is like that, where you have no awareness of the outside world, but then there's 
Sarvikalpa Samadhi. In Sarvikalpa Samadhi, we are aware of the world, but we're not aware of it as the world per se. We're only aware of it as our own consciousness. And that is the state of self-realization. Om Tatsat. Om Harihi Om.